Shirley fought back the tears that welled up in her eyes and gathered her belongings from her office desk, a cup, a calculator, a calendar, and various small items. Her friend tried to calm her down. Come on, Shirley, don't be so upset. It's just a job loss. You see, the company is on the verge of collapse. Salaries are being delayed. And since you joined later than everyone else, they decided to dismiss you first. You'll find a better job. You're still young. Besides, you have a wealthy fiancé, so you won't be left high and dry. The girl sniffled. That's true. We have a wedding coming up, and now I'm unemployed. Oh, I can already imagine the sarcasm from my mother-in-law. She never liked me anyway. She thinks I'm not good enough for her son, coming from an ordinary family and working in the archives, and now she'll scold me for depending on Brad. But it's not my fault that my mother raised me on her own. We always struggled financially. My mother is just an accountant, not a millionaire. I couldn't even afford to go to college, because I had to take an office management course after high school and start working. I had just settled in and gotten used to everything, and now I have to look for a job again. Such bad luck. Helen hugged her colleague and said, All right, things will turn around, don't be so down. If your fiancé loves you, he'll understand. And as for his mum, just ignore her. You don't live with her, after all. Well, take care, darling. I wish you good luck. Shirley returned home, feeling sad, and shared everything with her mother. Oh, my daughter, how unlucky, right before the wedding. Well, don't worry. Things will work out. Look through job vacancies. Maybe you'll find something you need. Shirley went to her room, changed her clothes, and collapsed on the bed, crying bitterly. How was she going to tell Brad? Brad's mother will definitely think that she is only dating her son for his money. Looking at a photo of her beloved, the girl remembered how they had met. It was so unexpected. On her way home from work, Shirley liked to stand on the bridge for a long time and gaze at the river. It always calmed her down. She did it almost every day. And one day, as the girl leaned on the railing, lost in the ripples on the water, she was frightened by a flash. It turned out that a young, attractive guy had taken her picture. Shirley looked at him, puzzled and startled, and he began to apologize. I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. You're very beautiful. Do you mind if I keep this picture as a memento? Look, it turned out great. Don't worry, I'm not a psycho or something like that. I'm just into photography, and I'm always looking for interesting shots. I have a whole collection at home. By the way, my name is Brad. Shirley blushed at his compliments and whispered, And I'm Shirley. No, I don't mind at all. I just didn't expect someone to take my picture right here on the bridge. I often come here. I like looking at the water. It makes me feel so calm and peaceful inside. The shot had indeed turned out beautifully. A pensive girl in profile, with her blonde hair fluttering in the wind, against the backdrop of passing cars. And so, the young people became friends, and soon realised that they were deeply in love with each other. They were drawn to each other like magnets, and not a day went by without them calling each other. Each date made them even happier. Brad was not an ordinary guy. He was the son of a businessman. In his twenties, he already had his own car, given to him by his parents. He dressed in the latest fashion, and had almost graduated from a prestigious college. Shirley, on the other hand, grew up in an ordinary, even poor family. Her mother Helen had raised her alone, and it was difficult to provide for Shirley on her own, but the woman always tried to make her daughter look just as good as everyone else. Shirley was now working as a file clerk for a company. The pay wasn't great, but the work was clean and organised. Initially, the girl was even afraid when she found out that Brad came from a wealthy family. She thought he would start flaunting his superiority, but no, Brad was surprisingly easy to talk to, open and not conceited at all. They were so good together that they soon decided to get married. Shirley's mother was overjoyed. She immediately took a liking to Brad, who was polite and tactful during their family dinner. However, Brad's parents were clearly not thrilled with Shirley. 
Mrs. Fuller pursed her lips and held back from biting harder, while Mr. Fuller looked down on Shirley with obvious condescension, showing off his importance. The mother tried to dissuade her son from attending the wedding. "'Son, come to your senses. You're making a terrible mistake. Linking your fate with this beggar? She has nothing. She lives in some dump with her mother, has no higher education, and has no prospects. What do you see in this simple girl, huh? Look at Megan. She is on a whole other level, stately, well-groomed, and studying at a prestigious university.' Her father has already bought her an apartment in the city centre. But Brad was adamant and only got angry. Mum, stop! Stop it! Why do you measure all people only by money? You married my father when he had nothing yet, and you yourself are not blue bloods. So what's the matter? Why can't I marry for love? I've seen your Megan a few times. She's a cheeky girl and a troublemaker, but in essence she's nothing. I don't need her. I don't like her at all. Understand? I love Shirley, and that's it. Let's finish this unpleasant conversation. I do not need a lavish wedding, and I do not ask you for millions. We'll just get married, and that's it. Mr. Fuller venomously remarked, Well, well, and where are you going to live, lovebirds? Or are you thinking of bringing your bride to our mansion? And with what money will you support your family? Not mine, I hope. You're just graduating from college. You're not on your feet yet. Brad answered with heat. It's nothing. We'll live. We're renting an apartment now, and that's okay. I work part-time. The main thing is that we love each other, and the rest will come. I want to achieve everything myself from scratch. It's important for me to realise what I'm worth without your money. Don't you understand? Shirley loved Brad very much, literally couldn't imagine life without him, and was terrified that he would prioritise his parents' opinion and leave her. And then there's this dismissal. Surely they will think that she got fired for being stupid. But the girl's fears were in vain. Brad hugged her, kissed her hard and consoled her. Don't be upset, my dear. Anything can happen. We'll celebrate the wedding, and then I'll help you find another job. I'm here for you. We're together. We'll manage. I love you. Always remember that. Shirley exhaled. I love you too, Brad. You're so great. I'm lucky to have you, and it's so good that we met back then. The day of the celebration came. Shirley put on a simple white dress and looked at herself in the mirror smiling. It fit her perfectly. Her mood was wonderful. Today was the most important day of her life. A wedding. What could be more exciting for any girl? But her mother-in-law did not share her joy. They were waiting for the newlyweds, with her husband in the restaurant lamenting. The mother of this hungry girl is coming now. I don't want to see her. What will she give to the young? She's got nothing. It's a disgrace. And where did our brat find such a fool? He should think with his head instead of believing in love. The newlyweds entered the hall. The guests greeted them and the fun began. Shirley's mother was dressed modestly, without frills, in a classic dress, with strict, discreet shoes. She wore a brooch and earrings as her only jewellery. When the woman stood up and took the microphone, Brad's mother snorted contemptuously. What a terrible dress! A la farewell to youth! As for Mrs. Fuller, she looks like an old teenager. The ultra-fashionable and provocative expensive scarlet dress was ridiculous on a woman her age, and the huge number of diamonds and gold weighing down her neck made her image heavy. Mrs. Fuller tried to look younger, regularly injecting herself with Botox. Her face was absolutely smooth, without wrinkles, but it looked more like an inanimate mask than a youthful image. Meanwhile, Helen began to congratulate the newlyweds. My dear children, Shirley and Brad, today is the most important day of your lives, as you become husband and wife. I wish you happiness from the bottom of my heart. Love each other, respect and support. 
and I have a present for you. Here are the keys to the summer house in the countryside. There's a river nearby, a forest. You can relax there from the city. The house, of course, is old, but it can definitely be fixed up. Be happy. Mrs. Fuller even jumped in anger and hissed, "Are you crazy? Why did you give our children a wrecked house in a remote village? Are you trying to finish us off and embarrass us? I don't know what to say, but what else could I expect from you?" Helen cried, not expecting such a negative reaction. She had even taken a loan from the bank to buy the house. She felt humiliated and disgraced in front of everyone. Shirley ran after her, confused and almost tripping in her wedding dress. She caught up with her mother on the porch and hugged her, pleading, "Mummy, where are you going? Please don't leave. Stay. Don't pay attention to Mrs. Fuller." Everyone knows she's quarrelsome. Thank you for such an unexpected gift. I know it's from the heart. Helen shook her head and replied, "No, my daughter, I can't stay. I have to go. Otherwise, I won't be able to hold back and confront that insolent woman face to face. I don't want to spoil your special day. Be happy with Brad. Goodbye." Shirley returned to the wedding, sad and crying. Looking at her mother-in-law with disdain, Mrs. Fuller was sitting there, pouting her over-pumped lips, and her son was telling her that such behaviour was unacceptable. He was ashamed of his parents. His father had given him a portion of the company's shares, but he could only receive dividends if he took over his father's business. However, Brad had repeatedly expressed that business was not his thing, but his father was stubborn. As a result, the wedding turned into a quarrel, and the joy of the occasion was wholly ruined. A couple of months went by, and Shirley couldn't find a job. Everywhere she looked, experience was required. But how could a young girl like her gain experience? Things weren't going well for Brad either. There were fewer and fewer job opportunities in his field, despite having recently received his diploma. His father. Deliberately blocked all his bank accounts as a way to teach his disobedient son a lesson. He hoped that Brad would suffer and eventually return to him and become a businessman. The money given as a wedding gift quickly disappeared, and the couple didn't have enough to pay the rent for the next month. They sat in despair in the kitchen, wondering what to do next. Suddenly, Brad exclaimed, "Shirley, what fools we are! Your mother gave us a house in the countryside." Can't we at least go and see it? Who knows? Maybe we'll like it. Shirley looked at him skeptically and replied, "Brad, don't make me laugh. You, a city boy who grew up in luxury, are going to the village. I can hardly imagine myself there. Of course, it wasn't a good idea of my mum, but you're right. It's worth taking a look. Maybe it can be a nice summer house for us." The next day, the couple set off early in the morning for the village. It was a long journey, and the road was bumpy. So, in the evening, they finally arrived. When they saw the gifted property, Brad whistled and said, "Yeah, the house is old. It must have been a manor house. Look at the carvings on the shutters, and the arched entrance with interesting columns. But its condition is deplorable. It needs plenty of repairs. The roof tiles have crumbled in places, causing leaks." And the corner of the roof is bent, possibly due to foundation problems. I can only imagine what awaits us inside. Shirley was quite upset, looking at the huge, gloomy, and abandoned house. It looked more like a barn than an estate. She muttered under her breath, "My mum must have been crazy. It's impossible to live here. What a gift! It's in the middle of nowhere, and it's practically falling apart." I don't even want to go inside. Let's leave. There's nothing to do here. We've just wasted our time. But Brad wandered around the yard, stood on a hillside, and gasped, "Shirley, don't be angry. Come here and see it for yourself. Your mother did something good. Don't be so quick to judge. Look at how beautiful it is. It's mesmerizing. The view was indeed spectacular." On the left, 
there was a forest with huge pine and fir trees, and on the right there were wheat fields. Not far away, the river seemed to merge with the endless blue sky. Combined with the vibrant sunset, it was truly beautiful. Brad became enthusiastic and led Shirley inside to explore the property. They unlocked the rusty door and entered. The smell of dampness and mice overwhelmed them. There were five large bedrooms with high ceilings, but their condition was truly deplorable. The plaster had become damp and was sagging to shreds. The floor was rotten in places and the boards creaked with every step. Shirley coughed and said, "'What a nightmare! So dusty! How can anyone live here? What should we do? I can't even imagine!' But her husband already had a well-defined plan in his head, and he began to tell it with fervour. "'There's a lot of work to do, of course, you're right. But if we do it gradually, one room at a time, we will have done it by the fall. The main thing is to repair the roof and the furnace first, then fix the well. But look at it from the other side. We currently live in a rented apartment, both of us without stable jobs. We pay a lot of money every month to our landlord, while we have our own place. There is a lot of land here, and we can have a little vegetable garden. There are also yard buildings available, so over time we can farm. There's plenty of space, clean air, grace and silence. Let's take a chance. I looked around as we were driving and realised that the village wasn't so abandoned. There's a store, a post office and even a school. Shirley looked at her husband, dumbfounded, and said, Well, you surprise me. I thought you would be the first to run away from here, because it's a lot of hard work and yet you've made plans. Well, I'm your wife now, so whatever you decide, that's how it's going to be. Where you go, I go. There's no other way. I'll try to get used to it and love this place, although it's a little creepy, to be honest, but together we'll probably get through it. Brad kissed Shirley, saying, We'll definitely cope, on our own. I don't want to live on my father's handouts you understand? It's important for me to make my own way in life, and I've loved nature since childhood. It's a bad start, but as they say, the eyes fear, but the hands do the work. So, what's up? Shall we move? Is it decided? Shirley nodded and said, Decided. I believe in you. When Mrs. Fuller learned that her son and daughter-in-law were leaving everything behind to live in the village, she made a wild scandal. Son, are you crazy, or have you fallen into some kind of sect? Where are you going? You're a certified specialist. Don't be silly. Go to work for your father. You'll be living comfortably. Is it better for you to be mowing hay with a scythe? I know it's your Shirley who's confusing you. It's all because of her. But Brad just waved her away and said, Mum, you can't hear me. I don't want to go to my father. Do you understand? I'm not interested. I'm not going to fight and live under such stress every day. I don't have that kind of temperament. I'm going to make it on my own. And stop insulting my wife. If you want to know, I'm the one who convinced her to settle there. Stay out of my life. We'll sort it out ourselves. Mr. Fuller only laughed and said, Let him go to this damn hole. I can even bet that in a month, at most, he'll be back home with mud on his boots. He'll come home and ask me for help. You see, he doesn't like my money-making schemes. Nothing. Money doesn't smell. That's even better. He'll soon realise what is missing and get smarter. On the contrary, Shirley's mother was pleased that the children decided to move and volunteered to help them with the repairs, especially since she was on vacation. The first thing they did was buy and bring building materials, hire a crew, and got down to business with great zeal. However, the money quickly ran out, leaving only enough for the exterior work, so they had to do the rest of the work by themselves. Helen said, Tomorrow morning we'll start stripping the walls. The plaster is holding badly, so we'll have to put it on again, and only then will we paste the wallpaper. At first, Shirley moaned and wailed. Her body whimpered and ached from unaccustomed hard work. 
she wanted to give up everything and return to the apartment, where there was comfort, a shower, and a soft bed. But her mother quietly encouraged her, saying, "Be patient, daughter. It's hard at first, but then you'll get used to it and get involved. The repairs will be done, and it will be easier. You have such a wonderful husband. Be proud. Do you think he doesn't get tired? He's never wielded a shovel before, and now he's got bloody blisters from unaccustomed use. He's tired to the point of shaking in his knees, wet with sweat." But he's still cheerful. He doesn't show it. A real man. You can't find a man like him nowadays. So don't grumble, and show him affection once in a while. Then there'll be peace in the family. Family, surely, is not only romance and beautiful bouquets, but also a sea of difficulties. And you need to be able to survive them together, shoulder to shoulder. Sometimes forgive. Sometimes keep silent. I was young and stupid. I didn't appreciate love, and it was all for nothing. It's very hard for a woman to be alone without a good and loving husband. So take care of Brad. My son-in-law is a very good man. The following day, they began working on the walls. Progress was swift, as the room was damp, and the plaster easily came off. However, when they reached the wall of the hall, they encountered a problem. There was a thick layer of mixture. That seemed to be firmly attached to the wall. Brad, already soaked, grabbed a crowbar and painstakingly chipped away at it, millimeter by millimeter. Suddenly, the sound became metallic, as if the iron tool had struck something metal. Curiosity got the better of the man, and he started hammering with double speed. That's when they discovered a secret door. Shirley pulled it open, and it swung open easily. Inside the alcove, there was a heavy chest. The three of them managed to lower it to the floor. When Brad opened it, they were all astonished. The chest was filled with treasure. Literally, it was packed to the brim with earrings, necklaces, and rings, all with tags indicating they were from a jewelry store. At the bottom, there were bundles of money. Shirley. In a state of excitement, tried on the rings, placing one on each finger, and exclaimed, "Oh my goodness! How beautiful! We've stumbled onto a treasure. We'll be rich. There are millions here. We're so lucky, Brad. Can you believe it? You've given us a royal gift, Mummy." However, Helen brought their excitement down a notch. She said, "Hold on, guys. Let's not get crazy." These items are obviously stolen. They all have tags, and they're clearly not historical or valuable treasures. What should we do, Brad? What do you think? According to the law, we should hand them over to the authorities, and we might be rewarded for it. Brad scratched the back of his head and sadly replied, "Unfortunately, you're right. We won't be able to sell them without getting in trouble." We don't know who they belong to, or when they were taken. The police might have additional information. As for the money, we should turn that in too, for the sake of our conscience. Maybe it's blood money. Who knows? For now, let's leave everything as it is. Helen, who did you buy the house from? Maybe the previous owner knows something. Although, if he did, would he have left such treasures? Helen pondered for a moment and said, "I've been thinking. What could I give you for your wedding?" Suddenly, I saw an ad for a house for sale in the village at an incredibly low price. I called and met the owner. At first, he seemed unreliable to me, with his restless eyes and tattoos, looking like a convict or a heavy drinker. His face was wrinkled, and he had very few teeth. He was quite repulsive-looking. But the documents were clean, and I checked them at a notary just to be safe. I fell in love with the place at first sight. The river is so clean; you can see the bottom, and the air is so fresh. So I bought it. I thought that if you didn't like it, I would retire there myself and give you my apartment. Brad looked at Helen with respect and said, "Thank you for taking care of us. You're a good mother. 
you're caring and compassionate. Shirley is just like you, kind and thoughtful. That's why I love her. Since all of this happened on Saturday, they decided to take the treasure to the police after the weekend. Meanwhile, they continued repairing the house, and the process was even faster. On that warm and peaceful evening, no one could have anticipated the trouble that was about to unfold. Shirley and her mother were busy in the kitchen, preparing a salad and setting the table. Brad was just hammering the last nails into the bench to make it less wobbly when two thugs burst into the yard. Their hardened faces and slang immediately revealed that they were convicts. They descended upon the bewildered Brad, shouting, Hey, where's our gold? Give it back now or we'll break your and your chicken's necks. We have nothing to lose. Although Brad was from a wealthy family and had never engaged in street fights, he was athletic and had practiced karate since childhood. He immediately fought back, saying, Get out of our house. It's ours, and there's nothing of yours here anymore. Do you understand? Shirley rushed out onto the porch, and upon seeing what was happening, became terrified and screamed. Helen quickly assessed the situation and said, Run quickly after the district police officer and ask for help. Don't stand still. Run as fast as you can. Shirley ran through the backyard, shouting to the whole street, Help! Good people, there are bandits attacking my husband. Someone, please help us. By the time the girl reached the police post, several local men, armed with pitchforks and axes, were already running towards our hero's house. In the village, there was a strong sense of community, and everyone rushes to help in times of misfortune. Helen was also defending her son-in-law from the bandits. She fiercely waved a shovel and shouted, Stay away from him! I won't let you harm Brad! Get out of here! Despite his determination, Brad was eventually wounded by one of the bandits with a broken bottle. Fortunately, the locals quickly came to their aid. While Shirley and the local police officer rushed to the scene, a chaotic fight broke out in the yard, with everyone trying to subdue the bandits. Eventually, the bandits were captured and tied to a pole. The convicts growled like wild beasts, breathing heavily and spitting out blood. The chairman of the village accompanied Brad and Shirley to the medical station to treat his wounds. Meanwhile, Helen, sobbing, recounted the events. We were about to have dinner when these bandits broke in. They demanded the treasure we had accidentally discovered. They threatened to kill us if we didn't comply. Brad, being a brave young man, stood up to defend our family. I don't know what would have happened if the neighbours hadn't arrived in time. The surprised police officer asked, Did you really find a treasure? Helen nodded and explained, Yes. Yesterday, while doing repairs, we removed some plaster and found an old chest hidden in the wall. It contained obviously stolen goods from a jewellery store, brand new, with tags. We planned to turn it in to the police, but we didn't have the chance. Apparently these criminals robbed the jewellery store, and not just one. It's unbelievable. We need to get rid of the stolen jewellery as soon as possible. An hour later, the stolen treasure was taken as evidence, and the bandits were sent to the police station. There was no mention of any compensation. However, Helen was relieved that everything had ended well. A paramedic treated Brad's wounds, which thankfully were not deep. Shirley took care of her husband, bandaging his injuries and bringing him hot tea and sandwiches. Brad grinned and said, Our opportunity to become millionaires didn't work out, Shirley, but I'm grateful for your care. I was so scared for you. If something bad had happened, I wouldn't have been able to bear it. Shirley crossed herself and replied, It's all right. We'll manage on our own, just as we planned. I don't want millions, if it means putting our family at risk. By the way, Tanya offered me her chickens. She doesn't have the strength to take care of them any more. Why don't we give it a try? You've always dreamed of farming, right? Let's start with something simple. Brad laughed, embraced his wife tenderly, and kissed her on the nose. 
That's coming from someone who grew up in the city. Of course, let's give it a try. We have to start somewhere. Brad prepared a fence and a shed, while Shirley whitewashed them. They acquired their first pets, twenty cute little chicks. Shirley followed the instructions of the elderly neighbor, and soon the chicks grew into healthy chickens. And Shirley was proud of herself. The repairs on the house also progressed slowly, with the help of their supportive neighbors. They were pleased and surprised that such young people decided to live in the village, as most people nowadays move to the city searching for a comfortable and prosperous life. In addition to the chickens, Brad and Shirley took in a dog named Teddy, who was given to them by the chairman, and a cat named Thomas. They even took the risk of raising a calf. This was their new life. Helen often visited them on weekends, helping and spending time with them. She enjoyed being in the old house, even though it wasn't fully settled. There was a kind of calmness about it. Unfortunately, Brad had no communication with his parents. After an ugly scandal involving his mother, he didn't even want to call them. He was deeply hurt by their lack of understanding and support. But soon he learned so many bad things about his father that it frightened him to the core. It had been almost three months since the arrest of the two convicts. They had escaped from prison while they were serving sentences for robbing multiple jewelry stores. During the second investigation, the convicts confessed everything. There was no point in hiding, since they were facing life sentences for killing a guard during their escape. It turned out that these convicts robbed jewelry stores based on a tip from another man, who planned the robberies and took his share. However, during the robbery of the last store, the thieves hesitated and set off the alarm system, forcing them to flee, rushing. As they fled, they frantically tried to figure out where to hide the loot to avoid getting caught by the police. They also wanted to deceive the spotter and keep the loot for themselves. One of the bandits. Remembered that his former cellmate had inherited a house in a remote, abandoned village. Therefore, they decided to hide their stolen goods in a secret compartment in the wall of that house, making sure they were well disguised. Unfortunately, the burglars were eventually caught by the police. Through a lawyer, the spotter warned the convicts that if they tried to betray him, he would get rid of them in their cells on the first night. The burglars got scared. And knew that it was better to obey the criminal authority, so they kept silent and claimed that they had robbed alone and threw away the stolen jewelry and money on the highway, where they didn't remember. The burglar's brother-in-law was instructed to keep an eye on the house. However, they didn't anticipate that the house owner would sell the house all of a sudden. Brad listened to all this and, at the end, asked the investigator. What a people! They don't stop at anything. Just a whole detective story, but you did not tell the main thing. Who was the spotter? In fact, he was responsible for the whole thing. And why did you call me? I'm not involved in this story, except for the fact that I found this stolen jewelry, because of which I also suffered. The elderly investigator sighed heavily and said, "That's the thing, Brad." That I called you not just for nothing, but to share the news. I have unpleasant news. As it turned out, the customer of all these robberies was your father, Mister Fuller. All his business is just a screen, a cover. In fact, he has long been known as a well-known personality in criminal circles, but he was always in the shadows, never getting his hands dirty. That's why, for so many years, we could not solve his dark deeds. Now that he's under investigation, he's looking at a decent sentence with confiscation of all his property. That's the way it is, Brad. Did you know anything about your father's illegal activities? Brad sat there, mouth open, unable to comprehend what he had just heard. Are you? Absolutely sure. How is this possible? Honestly, I refused to get involved in my father's business from the start. He always made risky deals, and I couldn't handle that. But the fact that he was involved in criminal activities and 
even robbed jewellery stores. I can't believe it. Oh, my God. Can I see him? I need to look him in the eye and ask him myself. Then I'll understand everything. Wait a minute. If my father is on trial and everything has been confiscated, where's my mother? We just had a quarrel before I left the village and we haven't been in contact at all. The investigator shrugged. I don't know for sure. You'll have to find out yourself. But as for visiting your father, I'll take care of arranging it. I sympathise with you, Brad. It's definitely not good news. But what can you do? Brad went to his mansion in the city, but it was sealed shut with no one inside. He started calling family and friends, only to find out that after his father's high-profile arrest, they wanted nothing to do with him. Many didn't even answer the phone, and those who did irritably claimed ignorance about his mother's whereabouts. They asked him not to call again, fearing damage to their reputation. Brad was a nervous wreck, clueless about where his mum could be. Where was she? Maybe she needed help. After all, his father's accounts were obviously frozen, and his mother had never worked anywhere. Brad arrived home in the village late, nearly midnight. Shirley was deeply worried and embraced him tightly. He told her everything, about his father's arrest, the thieves, and his concerns about his mother. Shirley hugged him tightly and said, If your mother has nowhere to go, she can live with us. I'll tolerate it. We can't leave her on the streets. There's plenty of room for everyone here, although she will have to adjust to a simpler lifestyle here. Brad kissed his wife, expressing gratitude for her understanding. He knew his mother had hurt Shirley in the past, but now was not the time to assign blame. They needed to find her and offer support. You're a real treasure. Let's go to bed. I'm exhausted. Today has brought so much bad news. My head is spinning. Just as the couple finished clearing the table and were about to go to bed, there was a loud knock at the window. Shirley shuddered. She had not yet forgotten how the last unexpected visit had ended. She whispered, Brad, don't go. Who could come at this late hour? I'm afraid. The man himself became nervous but didn't show it. He threw on his jacket and went out the house. The dog was barking furiously, having smelled a stranger. And then Brad heard the voice of his neighbour, Richard. Brad, Shirley, are you home? I've brought you a guest. Your mother came to visit but got lost, went the wrong way, almost all the way to the forestry. And I was just coming from the neighbouring village when I bumped into such a fashionable lady. And indeed, Brad saw his mother, covered in mosquito bites and crying. She had broken heels and the wheel of her suitcase, torn stockings and scratched legs. She could hardly stand from fatigue. The man rushed to hug her. Mummy, you're here. It's so good that you've come. I searched all over the city for you yesterday, but no one knew anything about you. Why didn't you call? I would have met you. Mrs. Fuller suddenly sobbed pitifully. I, I don't know. I was ashamed, to be honest. I hurt you and Shirley so much. My daughter-in-law was not treated like a human being, and only now, when I've had a lot of suffering myself... I realise how wrong I was. I'm sorry, my son. Will you take your mother in? You won't kick me out. I have nowhere to live. Your father is imprisoned and the house is confiscated. Brad took the suitcase and thanked his neighbour. Thank you, Richard, for bringing my mother. I owe you one. Come over tomorrow evening and we'll get to know each other properly. Mum, don't be silly. Let's go inside quickly. Shirley fussed around her mother-in-law, set the table warmed up tea, made her bed in the spare bedroom, and made her hot bath. Mrs. Fuller sat quietly like a mouse and watched her daughter-in-law. She thought to herself, What a good girl, kind, hard-working, and pretty. Why did I foolishly hold a grudge against her? Meanwhile, Shirley said, I've put a warm robe for you there, though it's not super fashionable, but it's better to put it on, because it's cold in the house. You'll definitely freeze in your silk pyjamas. 
especially after the bath. Do you have slippers, or do you want some warm socks? Mrs. Fuller suddenly looked intently at her daughter-in-law and took her hand. Shirley, my child, forgive me, a wicked, foolish woman. I was wrong to judge you and quarrel with my son. And now, as I look at you, I can't find a better daughter-in-law. Let's forget all the wrongs, shall we? I promise I won't be temperamental any more. I'll help you. I'm not really suited to village life, but I'll try. We'll live as one friendly family. Shirley was very pleased with these warm and sincere words. She felt that her mother-in-law was speaking from the heart. I am not vindictive. Everything will be fine. It only seems like life in the village is so hard and terrible. I thought so too at first. I got tired a lot and wanted to cry. Especially when we planted a vegetable garden for the first time in our lives, I spent half the night moaning from back pain. But you know, there are huge advantages: clean air, freedom, and no noise and bustle. And what about nature? We'll go to the river tomorrow, and you'll definitely fall in love with it. And the people here—they are maybe not aristocrats, but kind and helpful. When we were attacked by those bandits, half the village came to help us. Is that possible in the city? People live side by side for years and don't know their neighbors. Brad is building a farm, by the way. We'll have our own income, so we won't be lost. And I'm grateful to you for your son. I love Brad so much. He's the best. A week later, Brad and his mother went to the city to see his father. They were allowed to meet. Mrs. Fuller was anxious because, since her husband's arrest, they had never seen each other again. Brad didn't know what he would say to his father either: shout, accuse, forgive. Their relationship had always been difficult. Since childhood, Mr. Fuller tried to suppress his son's interests, pressured him, and tried to make him his assistant. But Brad was different. He loved nature and silence, and was kind, honest, and open. He didn't want to become a heartless tradesman. This confrontation between father and son lasted for many years. When Brad and his mother entered the meeting room, they were shocked. There was no trace of the self-confident, successful businessman. In front of them sat a tired and thin old man. Brad looked into his father's eyes intently and asked him directly, "Dad, is this all true? Was the business just a cover?" And have you actually been involved in criminal activities for a long time? I still can't believe it. If it's a lie, just tell me. I'll hire a lawyer, and we'll get you out. He lowered his head sullenly. Well, I understand your shock at hearing about me. Yes, son, it's true. Even though I'm terribly ashamed, no one, not even my beloved wife, ever knew what I was really doing. I always thought that money didn't smell, no matter how you got it. I guess that's wrong, but I did my best for you, so that you, dear, could live like a queen and not deny yourself anything. How many times have you been abroad? And you, Brad, did you need anything when you were a child? You had everything—the best tutors, classes, swimming pool, karate, and fashionable things. I wanted you to be like me too, but you're different—too kind, too soft—and it made me angry. A mama's boy. You were always closer to her than you were to me. I thought your desire to marry Shirley and your going to the country were bliss. It pissed me off. How could it be? I'm the king of life, and my son is a loser. I was sure you wouldn't last a week in this neck of the woods, and only when you almost got killed because of my past deeds, when I got here, in prison, did I get a real sentence? It's the only time. I've rethought my life. I've realized a lot of things. You're not worse than me. You're better than me, son. You didn't get involved in adventures. You didn't take the easy way out, even though you could have lived happily on my money. You chose love. You didn't betray Shirley and went against everyone. You did the right thing. It's your choice, and I respect it now. I'm proud of you, son. And I sincerely apologize that all these years, instead of just loving you as you are, 
I tried to remake you for myself. I've made many mistakes and done nasty things, and now I'm very sorry for it. It's a pity I can't go back. Brad could not hold back tears. He came and hugged his father tightly, whispered to him, No matter how you are, you are still my dad, the most dear person and I love you. I do not know how to be angry for a long time, and I forgive you. Mr. Fuller also hugged his wife and whispered to her how guilty he was and how much he loved her, knowing that he was saying goodbye to her forever. Time passed and life went on as usual. Brad rebuilt the farm behind the house and began to master this difficult business slowly. Shirley actively helped him with everything. They worked together from early morning until night, tirelessly. Six months later, Shirley's mum came to live with them. She sold her apartment in the city, paid off the loan she had taken to buy the house, and gave the rest of the money to the children. It was just enough to buy milking machines and the necessary equipment to produce farm cheese. The business grew, and soon entrepreneurs began to come to the farm to buy organic products like milk, cottage cheese and butter. All the household members lived amicably, and all the grudges and misunderstandings were long forgotten. In the evenings, they drank tea with strawberry jam and discussed plans for the future. Richard, a neighbour, often joined them. The man was a widower. His wife had died of a heart attack ten years ago, and his children had long started their own families. Over time, he developed a fondness for Shirley's mother, and he clumsily tried to care for her. One evening, Richard arrived at their tea gathering, dressed in formal attire, a white pressed shirt, grey pants with ironed creases and polished shoes. He was cleanly shaven, and the scent of men's cologne wafted from him. In his hands, he held a bouquet of chrysanthemums. Brad whistled and exclaimed, "'Richard, you look stunning. What's the occasion? Is it your birthday? Or are you getting married?' Richard coughed, looked deeply into Helen's eyes, and firmly declared, "'Brad, you're almost right. I came here to ask for Helen's hand. I can't live without her. She's constantly on my mind. Helen, in front of your entire family, I officially ask you for your hand in marriage.' I may not be a wealthy man, but I have a good house. Having a partner like you would be a dream come true. I admire your garden, and it fills my heart with joy. You tend to it with such love. If I don't meet your expectations, please tell me. We're no longer young children. Please take your time to consider and give me your answer. And this bouquet, it's from the bottom of my heart. Everyone was stunned, clapping, and staring at Helen. She blushed like a schoolgirl, feeling relatively ridiculous in her home polka-dot dress, while this man was openly confessing his love for her. Richard was also to her liking. They had many conversations about life, and he was a decent man who didn't drink much, only on holidays like everyone else. But to get married at this stage in her life? After years of being alone, she had forgotten what it was like to live with a man, she had long given up on the idea of finding happiness as a woman. However, she yearned for someone to love her, believe in her, support her, and be by her side. The woman looked guiltily at everyone and began to mumble, "'Well, you certainly know how to surprise me. I'm even flustered. You're a handsome man and an excellent host, and to be honest, I like you too. But how can I leave my children? I promise to help them.' There's so much work to do in the garden and on the farm. Shirley laughed heartily, looked at her husband and interjected, Mum, we're not infants any more. We can manage on our own. The most important thing is for you to be happy. We're all for it. Everyone joined in, laughing and chanting, Cheers! Cheers! Richard, undeterred, approached Helen. Richard, undeterred, approached Helen, shyly embraced her, and kissed her. Something inside the woman exploded, and a wave of tenderness washed over her as she felt the strong, gentle touch of his hands on her waist. Goosebumps ran down her body, a sensation she had long forgotten. It was incredible how this old, dilapidated house had brought the entire family together in such a remarkable way. It had a special, positive aura that calmed and uplifted everyone.
Soon, Shirley shared the joyous news with everyone. She was pregnant. Brad was overjoyed, jumping up and down like a child. Only Mrs. Fuller was initially shocked, looking at herself in the mirror and thinking, I'm almost a granny, oh my goodness. However, she expressed her pride and happiness for her son in a letter to her husband. You know, you'll soon be a grandfather, so hang in there for the sake of your grandson and don't lose hope. Our son is different from us. He lives with his heart and loves sincerely, and I'm proud of him. Money isn't his priority. He doesn't indulge in unnecessary extravagance or try to prove anything to anyone. He simply works and loves his family, selflessly and sincerely. And that means a lot. I've also found something I enjoy here. Making exquisite cheese using ancient recipes. So, you can be proud of me. Even someone as refined as me can thrive in the countryside. We all remember you and love you. Come back soon. The old house was rejuvenated, no longer resembling an abandoned barn. It was infused with new life, as it had become younger, and beamed with its new windows and sprawling grapevines.